Good morning. We would like to welcome everybody to worship at the Ankeny Church of Christ, both here at the building and those online and those who will join us later in the recording. But we are blessed to be able to come together as a family this morning to worship God. And it's for that reason that uh, we should give our whole lives the opportunity to return what he has blessed us with give him back not only the worship but the honor due him and the glory due him so let's take a little bit of time and we're going to sing some songs to help put us in a mindset as we uh, go into a day uh, where we honor our father and today is father's day so happy father's day to all our fathers uh, and for those men in our life who have been those godly examples who have helped us to come not only to faith but to, to grow to where we're at and uh, as we come together let's let's worship and praise the father who we should return all the glory and honors. Father God, so I, I know I haven't led this song before, but I did learn it, thanks to Rob. And, uh, Hopefully we'll all learn it here pretty quick. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I could fall. Give me strength. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praise, may my words bring honor to your name. Here I am, just for today, live in me, have your way, for my desire, when this race is run, is only to hear you say, well done, may my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praised, may my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship, may my thoughts be praised, may my words bring honor to your name. Before we get into our time of study in scripture, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for being our God, for seeing us through the times that uh, we're going through and the more challenging times that we've been through in our life. God, you are indeed faithful and you're always looking for us and wanting us to, to have that same trust and confidence in you that you display in, in allowing us not only to to be in your presence, but to desire to be with us for all eternity. And as such, God, we, we pray that the things that might get in our way of our relationship with you, God, we will put those to death and we will live for you with our utmost every day in every way. And God, we pray that in the same way, we will share the great news of your son and the redemption we have in him with as many as we can, as long as we have breath so they too can have that joy and peace and hope that's only found in you. We pray these things in your son. Amen. We're going to visit a passage of scripture that's very familiar. And uh, I want to start off with a little bit different a variation of uh, a story that you might have heard, an account that we have in scripture. And it goes like this, it's a bit of a tongue twister, so you guys bear with me on this, but a completely careless and condescending and cheeky child chose 
to coax his caring father out of cash and coin that he would have collected on his father's cessation of life. They quickly cruised the current countries to carouse and carry on like a cat in a confined corner. His cash-consuming chums cut cord when the chow cash and cheerful carousing ceased. Cash poor, craving chow, the careless chow coerced the swine collector to consent to commiserate chow to the swine. Continuously craving chow, he considered chowing down on the corn and crud the swine were consuming. He came to consider the craziness of his condition and concluded it would have been more constructive to be uh, to come home and claim contrition concerning his contempt and his discourteousness to his childhood caregiver. I'm completely crazy. My father's custodians can consume courses of chow considerably conspicuous in flavor and constitution. The castigated child crawled back to his childhood kin to correct his childish conduct. Casting himself toward his father's feet, Father, clear my conscience of this childish conduct that I have committed toward you and our kin. I have changed in my childhood for cheap choices, and I don't condone my choice, but charge me as a cheap servant and cause me to cultivate your crops and keep your commonwealth clean and clear. But the father clung to his child and cried, Choose a costly coat, a ring, and a, cap a capacious young cow to cook up. Let's carouse. Now, if we were to get into scripture and you were to turn to Luke, the 14th chapter, we would read a similar yet different story of what we just heard. But I think the point is that we often refer to this as the prodigal's son. Today, I want to talk about the prodigal father as it is Father's Day, and we have opportunity to honor those men that uh, have had that opportunity not only to be our dads, but so many to have uh, men of influence in their life that have filled that father role. But I want to look to God the Father this morning, because we understand from this scripture that the, the prodigal's father had a deep, deep love for his son, and there was no doubt about it. Now, from time to time, children can, well, they can choose to do some things intentionally or otherwise that can really hurt a parent to their, their core. And today I want to look at that account in scripture. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn over with me. And we're going to look uh, at this passage in Luke, the 14th chapter. And we're going to look at verses 11 to 22. Now this will be a little different reading than my uh, variation of it this morning, but I think that the, uh, we need to get into scripture to understand what it has to say. So beginning in the... Uh, Hmm, just got that one wrong. Luke 14, 11. Where am I way off? I put that one down wrong, didn't I? 15. I, I was like, this is not right, but I, I double-checked my scriptures, but I did that one wrong. So Luke 15, I apologize for that. Even I, you know, can, yes, make many mistakes as my wife might attest. Prodigal son, Luke 15, we'll get it right here in a minute, starting in verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate that falls on me. In other words, when you died, you're supposed to give me something. I want it now. So he divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate on loose living. Now, when he'd spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. And he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. But he came to his senses, and he said, How many of my father's hired men have enough bread? And here I am, dying with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up, came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, had compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said uh, to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, get the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on him, on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and let us celebrate, for the son of mine was dead. But he has come to life again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, we know in the latter part, and we'll get into this in a different sermon, is 
the uh, older brother's response. But I want to take a, just a few moments this morning and get into this section of Scripture together. Because I think that as, as we look at what God is trying to convey to us of his love for us, it's essential not only to, to see ourselves in this relationship, both as the prodigal son and sometimes even as the older brother, but today I want to look at, at our lives and the lives of our friends and our families and so many we care about as we might fall into this realm of being a prodigal son. But above that, what it means to be the father of this prodigal, the one who goes away and falls away. I mean, here's a man who threw away what he could have had and would have been blessed with a fortune to, to live according to his own standard. But I want to look at the caring father. Now, this story that Jesus is telling here is nothing new. It had been a story that had been circulated amongst the religious bodies for quite some time. As I might have accounted before, that so many of the, the Jewish leaders of the time might have told a very similar story, but yet with a different twist. Because in their story, the young man, he takes off, he runs away, he gets everything that he feels was due him from his dad, but he comes back home. But the father he is, he's, he's begging, God, please, Dad, forgive me. I am so sorry for what I've done. The dad rejects him. The dad sends him packing, says, I'm not going to have anything to do with you for as long as you live for how you have treated me. So Christ's story is vastly different than what the Jewish leaders of the day would have been saying. Not only did it uh, demonstrate that the father has a desire for his son and doesn't turn his son away, but he gives him a big old hug and says, give him the best of what I have. Give him the best row. Put a ring on him. Put some shoes on his feet. This guy is starving. Let's get some food in his belly. We have a reason to celebrate. He was lost, but now he is found. Why did Christ change the story? The narrative that so many leaders had told for so long that we are worthless and there's nothing that we can do that is ever going to bring us back into God's good graces because that's what they were telling a lot of folks and that's how they were living. The truth is there were a lot of folks in that time and a lot of folks today that have a very messed up view of who God the Father is. You see, God the Father is somebody cold, distant, uncaring, somebody who just wants to punish us for all the wrong things that we do. Like, oh, he is sitting and waiting for us to mess up so he can condemn us. Because the problem was that's exactly what many of the Jewish leaders of that time were doing. They were sitting around waiting for those who were part of their fold to mess up so they can just kick him out and say, you are worthless, get out of my sight. So Jesus twists that. He changes the story. Now let me ask you, the next slide would be, does God judge us? And yes, there is going to come a time where God will, in fact, judge us. But it's going to be according to his standard and not our standard. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, in verse 21 to 23, we see a familiar passage. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things? But his reaction will be, I didn't know you, apart from me. I have a feeling that there were a lot of people in Christ's time who thought they were doing the right thing, but they didn't have an understanding of what they were to do and how they were to live. And they were putting weights and burdens on people that were never intended. And they were not even themselves living up to the standards by which they were telling others to live by. Thinking that they had it all right, that they were checking off all the boxes. But as we see throughout scripture, so many of them did not have the love of God in their heart. And as such, they were missing the whole point of why he was asking them to do any of that to start with. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, we see a, a list of, of what God will not allow into his kingdom. The wicked, those that are intentionally sinful in the way they live out their lives, those that choose to live for sin over him will not, he says, inherit. There will come a time where he judges all of mankind 
And he says, if this is how you are choosing to live, I have some bad news for you. You will not be part of my kingdom. So I need you to change. I need you to repent. I need you to start living for me rather than the things of this world. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, just before this, he says, look, there's going to be times in our lives where we are persecuted, where people are going to look down on us because we are Christians. We're striving to do the right. We're viewed as weak and defenseless, and they will strive to take advantage of that. But he says, look, there will come a time where I will pay back those of you who have had to go through a lot of stuff. And he says, for those who are living on the other side of the coin, those who have chosen not to know who I am, and those who have not chosen to obey the gospel and live in it, you will not make it. You're, in fact, going to feel my wrath. The wrath of God is not a place that any one of us wants to be. God will judge all of mankind at the appointed time. But he like the prodigal uh, father here, is not going to slam the door in our face. No matter how far we might wander away, he is always there, always ready to accept us back, always ready to forgive us. Now that wasn't the popular opinion of the day either. Felt if you sinned too much, you gone too far away, there was no coming back. You were outcast, you were helpless, you were hopeless. You had no value to anyone anymore. So Christ's word, I think that they caught the listeners who were hearing this parable off guard. Wait, wait, you're telling him that the, the dad took him back after what he did? He, he took his name and ran it through the mud. He went off and just lived this terrible lifestyle and, and, and then he comes back, and, and his dad takes him back after that. I can't even imagine. What, what, why would he? And they begin to question, because this is not what we've always grown up with. This is not the story we have always heard. Why would he do this? This guy is a loser. He, he cost him so much. Why would the dad take him back? So in the next scripture, in the next, in the next slide, in verse 24 and 29, or 32, rather, it says that um, we see that his attitude toward his son was that he saw that he was lost, but now he is found. He points this out on two occasions in verse 24 and 32 because it is important. It's important both to, to the, the, the kin who are right there with him at that time and as well for the son to realize you are lost, but I love you so much and you're, you're, you're found, you're home. He points it out to the brother as well who might miss the point. The fact is he has that much love. God wants to redeem us, to buy us back. Yes, he will judge us according to how we have chosen to live our lives, but he loves us. And he doesn't want us left as damaged goods. He doesn't want us in a far country living how we feel how we ought. He says, look, I have a standard, and this is where I want you to be, and I want you to work toward that. I want to allow my spirit to perfect you, to work in you, to make you what I'm calling you to be. He doesn't want us damaged, torn up, helpless, and hopeless. He wants us to be alive, to be found again. But the other point would be made in verse 21 where the son says, look, dad, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now those two points are true. He did sin against God. He didn't honor his father. He treated him like trash and said, give me what's mine now. I'm not going to wait till you die. And then I can only imagine how he ran his name through the mud as he was out living the sinful lifestyle. So yes, he sinned against heaven. And he did sin against his father. But I think the third point he kind of messed up on, he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. What gives us worth? What can we as, as, as men and women ever do to feel like we have gained worth in the eyes of God? To say, God, you owe me. God, I deserve this. The fact is we are all, because of our sinful nature, worthless. We have no value until we come to know who Christ is and what he has done for us. And that's where we find what our value is in this life. 
that he wants to call us his child. To say, I want you to come and understand how deep my love is for you. I want to give you this gift that gives you the most value you will ever have in your life. Because I want to redeem you. I want to be with you. God loves us. He loved us from our creation. He knew us before we were ever born. So yes, he gave us value in that. But in the way we've chosen to become a prodigal and to go after the things of the world, he says, look, until we make the decision to say, I want to come home, we won't have that worth. Romans, the third chapter, in verse uh, 23, says, look, we all mess up, don't we? We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Nobody is worthy. God doesn't owe us anything. He's not indebted to us. Now, I have a lot of love for those who were teaching Bible classes, even right now, because it is a lot more challenging right now to teach a Bible class than if you were to have kids come in and sit and try to have their attention. Because you have no idea when that microphone is muted what they're saying behind the screen. Because they're like, you know, their lips are moving. They're like, yeah, I'm not a lip reader. So I have no idea what they're saying when the, mute, you know, when the mic is muted or when their screen goes to just their name. But the fact is, you know, you might be a Bible teacher. Deacon, deacon's wife, elder, elder's wife. You might be a preacher, preacher's wife. You might be a member. But the fact is, none of us are deserving to be called a child of God if it were not for what he has done for us and his gracious gift of Christ. And that's Christ's point here, that God loves us, that he is, he is standing there waiting for us. In our scripture reading, it says that while his son was afar off, he saw him and he ran to him. He was waiting and watching for his son. He's like, I want you to come home. Where are you at? And he was watching. And I imagine almost every day he was watching that road that led up to his house, waiting for his son to come back down that road. And then he did something you just didn't do in that day. He had a robe on. He would gird up his robe. He would tuck it in. He would pull it up past his knees so he could take off running, tucks it in his belt. You didn't do that as a guy. That was not, uh, it was not cooth. It was not uh, something that society would accept. So for him to do that, demonstrating, I don't care about societal norms. I care about that kid coming up my road right now. God says, look, I care so much. I want you. And he goes up and he embraces him. His son's trying to spit out this rehearsed speech that he has. Oh, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer in love me. And he's like, I love you. Hey, guys. Hey, he's back. Get all this stuff for him because he is home. And that's how he feels for us when we make that decision to say, you know what? I want to go home. I want to be with God. I'm tired of living in the pigsty. I'm tired of eating all this crud that is put out in front of me. These pods, these shells, this nastiness. These pigs are eating. If you ever been around it, it is the leftover of leftovers. It is not the main course that you are feeding pigs. And for him to consider, that's looking pretty good right now, demonstrates, wait, I might need to make some changes. Because this is not the way I want to live my life. And when we recognize sin in our life, that's where the light bulb goes on and we say, you know what, I don't want to live like this. I want to come home. Now, society that time would say, you know what, Dad, you ought to, instead of bear hugging him, you ought to slap him across the face and put him in his place. You ought to lay into him, punish him, beat him, because he is not deserving. He has disrespected you. I know, Dad, he probably heard all the stories coming back in from friends and neighbors. You might have been at one of those, Woo, you should have seen the party your boy was having. It was crazy. Man, that money that you gave him, I can't believe how he's spending it in the I'm sure it broke the Father's heart just like God's heart breaks when he knows what we are doing. But rather than to punish him or slap him in the face, he embraced him. And he celebrated. And God celebrates when every single one of us purposely says, I am done with living this way. 
whether we are already obedient to the gospel and living in that obedience or whether we are about to make that decision to say, I want to be obedient to the gospel. It is about saying, you know what? I want to do it his way. I want to come home. Now, I don't know what your earthly fathers and their stance is on faith. But I think one of the greatest experiences that I've had thus far in my life is to see my kids be obedient to the gospel. And as such, know that they've entered in and they've accepted that hug and saying, come home. But understanding it's not a one and done. It is a continual obedience to that gospel, continuing to live in it, continuing to share in it, and to grow in it as we've been talking about. But if we think that we are too far off, that we have wandered too far away, I want you to think about this account today and understand that he says, no, I love you. And no matter how far you've gotten off track, I want you to come home. I want to embrace you and I want to welcome you into this relationship with me again and to call you my child because that's exactly what we are. We all know that that is a choice that we have to make for ourselves. It's not something that can be forced on us. Yeah, we might feel forced into a relationship, but it ultimately comes back to our choice and what we do with it. And he's saying that invitation is open. My arms are always outstretched waiting for you. What are you going to do with that? You know, I pray that we enter into that relationship with our Heavenly Father. We make whatever changes and decisions we have to make. Last scripture I want to leave with you is in 1 John. 1 John, the first chapter, looking at verse 8 and 9, he says, look, if we confess our sins, it says that he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 9. We need to say, God, I have sinned against you. I am so sorry. This is not. And so often before those words come out, he will purify us. He will make us clean. He will say, here is a robe of rings and sandals. Let's party because you are home. You are on the right track. Let's do this thing together. If you're struggling in your faith, I pray that you don't wait another day, but you reach out. Reach out to God the Father and ask for forgiveness and reach out to others who can help you get back on track because today is that day. We are not promised tomorrow. You know, we want to, as a body, remember just how deep his love for us. We don't have to go very far. Because here in just a moment, we are going to partake of what is the Lord's Supper. The opportunity for us to remember just how deep his love is for us. That he gave his only son to redeem us. And he says, I want you to remember it, not just once a week, but I want you to remember every day. But because we are a forgetful people, I want you to remember every week. Come together as a family. Celebrate this love that I have for you in giving my son and his body but to remember just what it costs for you to be in that relationship with him that you don't forget. So on the next slide, you're going to see that we have come together as a family today to partake of that supper, that Lord's Supper. So I want to go ahead and, and uh, have an opportunity for us to draw together and remember just what that sacrifice means for us. Good morning. I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about uh, redemption. A lot of it uh, similar to what we just heard through, through Rob's lesson. But I want you to go to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, if you would, and read that along with me. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Evident that no one is justified by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Jesus said, 
that whoever sins is a slave to sin. So because we're all sinners, all of us are slaves. The problem is we cannot free ourselves. The bail is set too high. We must be perfect in order to be set free. Because of our sin, we are all in a spiritual prison called sin. We are without hope, trapped, and cannot get out. We need someone who is outside the prison, someone who is perfect, to pay the price and to set us free. This is what it's meant, what it means to be redeemed, to pay the price so a slave can be set free. On the cross, Jesus paid our sin debt completely and set us free from our sins. Our debt is paid by the blood of Christ. So as Rob talked about redeemed, redemption, we don't deserve it, but it's a gift because of God's grace. He paid the price. Christ paid the price for our sins with his blood. We remember with great reverence the sacrifice, but we also rejoice and celebrate that God's grace has redeemed us and set us free. As we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, let's remember Christ's body and blood that was given for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to partake of this uh, bread and this fruit of the vine each week, to, to remember the body and the blood of Christ that was given for us freely of his own free will in obedience to the Father. And Father, as we partake of it, let us consider our own lives and the sin that is in them, the sin that is taken away by that blood, so that when God looks at us, he only sees his son Christ living in us. As we pray through Christ's name, amen. He paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him in that day? I then will sing a brand new song amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Well, we would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I do want to Take an opportunity to, uh, I know that Mother's Day came up and it kind of snuck up. We weren't expecting to be back in the building, so we didn't have all of our Mother's Day gifts at that time. Uh, for those who are here, there are uh, these wonderful uh, pens, ladies and guys, you can have whichever one you want, I guess. But if the guys are like, well, I like flowers, then you can get this one. Or, But the guys actually has something written on it, It's, uh, but it's upside down, so I can't see what it says right now. Something about, uh, I can't read it either. 
Men of faith lead by example. That's what the pen is. It has the highlighters that uh, are great for your Bible. So man, as you're highlighting in your Bible, it's the wax kind that doesn't bleed through, which is always nice. But uh, I want to encourage you on your way out to, to grab one of those. And uh, if you're thinking, hey, I'd love to have one of those and you're stuck in your house, let us know. We'll be glad to bring one of those by for you. But uh, we appreciate all of our men and women uh, of faith who uh, do lead by example. Uh, I also want to make a couple uh, quick announcements here after our prayer. So uh, just hang in there. But let's let's go ahead and close our time with a, a prayer and thanksgiving for all that God has done today and will do. Father, we uh, we do humbly come before you. And God, you are a God that is full of mercy and grace that you just pour out on us. And God, we know we don't deserve it. God, we look at our lives and we see how we are so much like the prodigal. We go after the wrong things and we can be very demanding in our life and very little return. So we just pray forgiveness on our part that we can be more of what you're calling us to be. And we thank you that you are a God of open arms that will bring us back and forgive us. And allow us to live a life that is not only demonstrated in repentance and striving to to not only know your will, but live it out and help others to do the same. But God, we we just thank you for being our father and for being there for us and throughout the whole of our life and throughout all of eternity. And God, we pray that uh, for those family members in our church and those who are our friends and those who are really struggling right now in our our world that in whatever way we can, that you will allow us to be your hands and feet, to reach out and to, to help meet those needs. For some, they're really hurting physically right now and they're having a hard time. We just pray that you will provide what they need in their lives and will allow you to continue to be that source of strength to get them through. And for those who might have some mental challenges going on right now. They're just blocked or they're down because they're not able to see other people or whatever the case might be, that you as well will help us not only to reach out but to meet that need. And some have financial trouble and some have some spiritual sickness. And we pray that in every way, you allow us not only to know the need, to seek it out and to meet it. God, we know it ultimately will come from you and we thank you for all that you provide for us. We pray this in your son, amen. Well, we are glad you're here. We do have a couple birthdays this week. Uh, Hannah and Murray and uh, Phyllis turn, I think Phyllis turns 90 and they're doing a card thing for her. So if you didn't see that, get Phyllis a card because she turns 90. It's a big kind of an opportunity for us to reach out to her. We haven't seen her in a while because she's also kind of isolated in her nursing home. So uh, uh, an opportunity for to, to celebrate her as well. Um, There's also the uh, Ruth Harper cleanup for those who signed up. Don't forget the 27th, which is uh, Saturday, right? So don't forget Saturday to clean up. If you like, I didn't get a sign up, don't worry. There's also gonna be a cleanup at the Des Moines uh, Ruth Harper house on the 11th of July. And uh, has the sign up gone out yet, Doris? Not yet. So look for it, sign up tomorrow. So you just keep checking your email. If you're like, I I missed it because it signed up and filled up too quick, then just be like, look for it this week tomorrow and sign up because it's a great opportunity for us to reach out to those ladies and families. Uh, And those were the announcements that I have. Uh, Appreciate you guys being here and uh, have a blessed week.